why does my liking my idea have to stop me from writing the idea? Right, right. Maybe, maybe what you like and don't like can, right now is not essential. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And today we have a special episode talking about a few things. One, we did our very first event. Yep. So we got a shout out to all y'all who actually went to our very first live event. Also, we got to talk about brand identity and why your current music and products that you create don't always have to match your current brand identity. Having a lot of followers, but still being broke and why people who have followers should be able to make money. And if they aren't making money, there's an answer to why, but it's not what you think. I promise you that. Watch this to get the game. And we got a couple other interesting topics, but we'll just let you stay and see. First and foremost, I want to get to this clip. To me, that's about brand identity and why artists should stop letting things that sound good to them keep them from writing the things that sound bad to them. I know that sounds weird. Uh, okay. All I know right. that sounds weird. <laughs> but listen to the legend John Mayer. Now I'm actually at the point where I'm going, why do I need to like what I'm writing? What if I can write things that I don't even like at the moment? But, that but then I'm what would be the write? point? If you don't like it, it's because it just exists a little bit beyond your own tastes for that moment. But if you don't like it and it's a hit, then you're going to be stuck. No, you begin to like it. Oh, okay. Like, that's what happens as a writer. You write something and go, I bet this isn't any good, but your tastes catch up to it. So now I'm going, I know it's a very complex, kind of twisted thought, but right. why does my liking my idea have to stop me from writing the idea? Right, right. Maybe, maybe what you like and don't like it right can... now is not essential. All right, so first, I know, it's, it's, it's getting meta beyond meta. Yeah, so, and I think, so a lot. I think that's what people need to be aware of who don't know John Mayer. This isn't like some record exec saying like, oh, just write some super commercial shit, right? Mm -hmm. Or some like super commercial artist. He's known as like one of the artsy, artsiest people, right? So he's not talking, hey, just write some bullshit, create a hit. He's talking literally like, I can hear an artist who is searching for ways to continuously unlock the things that are blocking them. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what he sounds like, mm -hmm. right? Because you even had Andy Cohen, I believe his name is, go, yo, like, well, wouldn't you be stuck in a... Um, in a in a spot that you don't want to be in, if you write a song that you don't like and it becomes a hit, right? So there's a couple of thoughts that are important to me in this whole conversation. The very first one is brand identity, personal identity, and how people allow their current personal identity to lock them in to a lack of creativity. Right, mm -hmm. and keep them from exploring new ideas because this is what I look at it as. Time and time again in people's lives, they'll say, oh, I wouldn't wear this. I won't listen to this. All right? And they define themselves by things that aren't actually them. All right? How many times have you seen someone, maybe you've experienced this, you don't like a certain type of clothing right, or a certain type of fit, but then five years later, you find yourself dressing kind of like how you wouldn't dress before, mm -hmm. right? You're not locked into a, that the identity. Your clothing, as much as we like to act like how we dress is like who we are, maybe it's more of a reflection of who we are at the moment, but it's not actually who we are. We're more abstract, right? We're constantly evolving. And I think that's a, what he's kind of alluding to. It's like, yo, I don't like it right now. My taste hasn't evolved to like this. Maybe I will never like it, but... Why don't I write it anyway? Now, his versions, like he didn't really speak on why he sees value in writing it anyway. I would have loved to hear that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But like just going ahead and doing things sometimes and trying things sometimes that are beyond your taste and what your current perspective is. To me, that's those are the people who begin to evolve faster than those who stay locked in to this one way of doing things. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it, it kind of speaks to a point we've made a couple of times where like your taste or your likes as an artist doesn't necessarily dictate the taste and likes of the audience that you're going after. And I've heard other mm. songwriters and producers say that people that are great in those areas understand how to write things for audiences that may not be their audience, right? Like yeah. the, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is like, let's say like Lil Yachty and the City Girls, you know what I'm saying? Like their fan base isn't his fan base, 
more than likely, but he understood it enough to be able to write something that, that would perform well for them within that community. You know what I'm saying? If he, I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't like the subject matter. Well, I, I'm not going to speak for him, but you know, I will be willing to bet that he didn't stand by or like the subject matter, but he's like, hey, I understand how the, this group of people thinks, so I'm going to write something for that group of people, even mm-hmm. if it may not be something that I personally agree with or resonate with. Yeah. You know, which I, I, I agree. I think that's a that's a sign of a great like creator. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially ones that have been around as long as John Mayer, where I, I'm in a bag where I can create for these different groups of people, even if I don't particularly like it. And I don't know, man, I feel like more artists need to hear that because I don't know, I'm going through a situation right now where we got we got a, a guy a guy we working with where he has a song that he hates. But he's been teasing it and his audience loves it. But he hates it. You know what I'm saying? Like and I yeah. and I can tell like he's thinking exactly what the other guy was thinking. Like, man, if I put this shit out in the go like y'all keep saying it is, I'm gonna be stuck, you know what I'm saying, doing this shit forever and I don't fuck with it. But it then it boils down to, you know, back to the conversation of who are you creating music for, right? Where a lot of artists like to make it sound like I'm making music for the people until they make something that they don't like what people like, you know? And then yeah. their whole shit go out the window, you know what I'm saying? Now it's back to just about you, <laughs> what you want to be out there and what you like. So I'm glad someone like John Mayer is the center, because to your point, I would yeah. never have guessed John Mayer would have this, this, this right. train of thought, you know what I'm saying? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I think, like, kind of what you alluded to is the fact that being able to write from different perspectives, thing, being able to think from different perspectives, mm. Is really powerful. Clinton Sparks mentioned this in his interview that we just dropped last week. Y'all go check that out. But it touches on why I think as a marketer, like that's what we're doing constantly. Yep. Right. The best marketers can think from perspectives that don't necessarily resonate with who they individually are as a person, but you're able to analyze the audience, see, understand how they think, and then speak to them in their language in mm-hmm. a way that feels authentic to them and triggers the things that, you know, match their whole um, yep. being. So uh, I can only imagine as a writer, in the same way that sharpens your your skill set as a copywriter, yeah. right? Yeah. Or a marketer creating messaging. It only does the same thing for an artist, but I think artists kind of, um, I don't know, they, they get caught up in thinking that that'll take away from who they are. But if anything, you should look at it as I gained a perspective but then I'm bringing it. I'm gonna bring it back to my shit. Yeah, because you know it, it expands who you are, bro. Like when the world learned that Lil Yachty wrote that City Girl song, true. That shit was crazy. Like it just it just yeah. made me think. It made me think so differently of him, right? Like yeah. I was like, man, I I never would have guessed up until that point that Yachty was even capable of of writing to that point. But now because of that, now that I have that information, I view him so much differently as a writer. And now over time, as he's gotten, you know writing credits for different songs and then he's out there more as a writer like it's it's, it's built up that respect that he has now in that community you know what that's I'm saying? big that's one of the biggest ways and signs of respect it seems like mm-hmm. when people write for other people and it's successful yeah because it's, it's like i mean i think about it from the artist perspective it's like i'm asking you person that's not me to speak for me mm-hmm. to my and then when it's you know what i'm saying like um different audiences like who was the guy you were showing me the og can't OG think Maco? Of no, 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 no. He's no. <laughs> an OG R&B songwriter, but you were showing me that he wrote like a big rock song or like a pop rock song back oh, in the day. Oh, man. Babyface. Babyface. It was Babyface, yep. But was it Linkin Park or whoever the fuck? It wasn't Linkin Park. I think it was um, Downtown, you ready or not, that group. Um, whoever they were, bro. That w- it pull it. it might have been them. Like whoever they were, yeah. but when I learned that about him, I was yeah. like, oh, this nigga's a genius because yeah. I know for a fact that this is not his demographic. Nowhere near, <laughs> Nowhere is near bad. bro. Like, Nowhere not, near his bag. But he wrote one of the biggest songs ever for that demographic. Yes. Despite his own background, his own personal taste, the types of music that he makes. Yep. And that shit speaks volumes about his 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 level of creativity and his genius when it comes to that shit, bro. Cause yep. like, you know, cause I, I do think that now, and you bring up this point a lot, right, where a lot of times artists let creativity stop at their own music. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I think it is a flex to be able to show your creativity through somebody else's art. That's a huge flex because it's so many barriers. It's like, mm-hmm. the, how is the person going to perform it? How are they going to feel about it? Can I write something that that feels authentic to them that also speaks to it? Like, it's so many barriers to having something come out of that process and be good that when you do it and it's for a group of people that isn't your group of people, like, I can get, like, you know, back to the Yachty point. If Yachty wrote a hit song for, like, Playboy Cardi. Or like yeet or something. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That that 
basically speaking yeah. to the same group of people. But the city girl shit, bro, I'm like, it's a group yeah. of people that you're not talking to, yeah. interact, interacting with, you were still able to write a hit song. The baby face shit, bro, here's a group of people you're not talking to or interacting with, but you can still write something that, that the vessel can do authentically and the audience connects with. That's, that shit is another level of genius. It is. It's <laughs> like when you get to that point where it's just like whatever I touch is creative. It doesn't have to be this version of creative mm-hmm. that fits a box of what, yep. you know what I mean? It's like, nah, just whatever I do, bro, like yeah. you're going to feel it. You know, that's how someone like Kanye kind of like moves, right? Yep. Like everything he goes into is going to be, yeah. it's going to be that. This person said something interesting. K. Roosevelt said, he's spitting real game here that a lot of people probably don't understand. Sometimes you write, create something, and and hate it initially for various reasons. Could be personal insecurities. Could just be a little ahead of his time. Yeah, it's a great point. Same reason when you go back to like the clothes example, right? You just might not be comfortable wearing that at that time, right? Like yeah. I, I'm not comfortable wearing this when the rest of the world isn't wearing this, right? Yeah. Or I'm not comfortable wearing this when the rest of the world is wearing this, right? Depending on how your insecurities are set up. Right, and your yeah. identity is set up, but now I can I can I can wear this. It's like, damn, I'm not somebody who would wear hats or whatever hats. I feel weird, like people looking at me. Next thing you know, yeah. like hats being like a normal thing you yeah. wear. That's how I used to feel about mesh t-shirts. Really? Yeah. See, but then I got started working out. Man, got a little muscle. I was see, like, this shit look good on me, man. Exactly. That's, 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 it, 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 all of that shit is the same. That's funny. <laughs> that's funny as hell. <laughs> Oh uh, man, and and the point too. What was it? Uh, the personal insecurities because we've talked about it before with content. Where like I I know for a fact I've made videos. I'm like, oh, that shit terrible. I don't fuck with. It. Let me put it out anyway. And then the audience is like, this is the the best thing you've ever made, man. Mm-hmm. This is so much game. And you just like it goes back to the point where sometimes even though you were the creator, you're just wrong about it, <laughs> and that and that is okay. It is okay to be wrong about your own art. <laughs> hey, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, like I mean, it's like because what's the what opinion are you following? Is it just you might be right about the fact you don't like it? Yeah, but you yeah, might yeah. be wrong about how the world feels. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I want to look up something real quick with John Mayer. See what his monthly listeners are. You want to make a bet on what it is? Just before you look it up. All right. Yeah. What you bet? Seven million. Ten dollars on seven million. Bro, I was gonna go exactly seven million. <laughs> you let me see. That's crazy because I was gonna say seven. Fifteen, we both wrong. Damn, that's crazy. We both wrong. <laughs> I just had to check it out because someone said he writes music that almost nobody likes. I'm like, that's that's just not a fact for, for John Mayer. He's not I'm not listening to every John Mayer song, but you know, you gotta put respect where respect is is due. I don't know why I thought John Mayer was bald. I don't know why I thought that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. even I don't know who I don't even know who I'm thinking of. <laughs> who am I thinking of? Who's the other soulful white dude? Other soulful white dude? Yeah, the other soulful white dude that black people love. There's two of them? Yeah, bro. Um, he was on Travis Scott album. I think. Oh, was John May on Travis? Was John May on Travis Scott album? James Blake. There we James go. James Blake. James Blake. There we go. Oh, yeah, they're completely different types of soulful. <laughs> I would say black people probably like um him more than they like John Mayer. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, in 100%. terms of like hit the culture specifically. Yeah, that's the white Frank Ocean, man. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so one of the most important things that artists have to realize, if you truly become a brand, then everybody that buys from you no longer has to be a fan. I know that sounds mind boggling. You have people buy from you who support your career, who support your movement that aren't even fans. But the truth is regular businesses do this every single day. And that's how we had this realization that we then began to capitalize off of with our artists. And if you want to see this for yourself, I'll show you for completely free. If you go to www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize, you have to put in www. And if you're on YouTube, you can find it in the description somewhere. So just go there and I'll show you the massive paradigm shift that we had that allowed us to start to help our artists monetize their audience way faster while increasing the amount of people that they can monetize at the same time. So basically, a lot more money, you know what I'm saying? So check it out, www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize while it's completely free to check out. Back to the conversation. All right, let's get into this. Having 2 million followers, but still being broke. I had 2 million followers and I was working for somebody else in a shoe store, right? right? To the world, I was popping, but to myself, I was lonely, I was broke, I didn't have money, I was super popping, I was getting a million views, and most of y'all out here, y'all compare y'all lives to the people that y'all look at on, so- oh, I don't want to talk too much. No, but- Am I talking too man. much? No, no. Go ahead, man. Okay. 
You guys com compare your life to the people that are on social media getting med millions and millions of views, but I was once one of those people that had two million followers, and I was broke. I was lonely. Right. I didn't have a team. Yeah. I didn't have people that believed in my craft. You know what I mean? So it's He touching on a lot of different things. This is what I want to bring it back to. If you have two million followers and you're broke, most people will say it's because your followers ain't real or they follow you for no reason. Maybe. I think the more important thing is you don't understand sales and marketing. Though. Yeah, 100%. If you got two million followers, all right, the false idea might be, okay, yeah, they're trying to follow me just for who I am and I'm just going to drop something around my name and that's going to pop, right? Or I should be able to get invited out to shows. This person is, a, uh, is an influencer, by the way. He's not an artist. But the important thing is, if I got 2 million people watching me, I'm able to say, well, fuck me and my ego. What type of people are following me? Mm -hmm. What do they like? Mm -hmm. What can I sell them at much, a profit? How much money do they got to spend? How much money do they have, have to spend? And then... You know, sell them something accordingly. And I think that's the bigger problem when you find these people who have these audiences that are legitimately getting the views. I'm not talking about fake views, right? None of that yeah. stuff. Legitimately have two billion followers, legitimately have views. I think too many times the the public figure, whether that's an artist, an influencer, comedian, whoever, right? They'll build these audiences for whatever in in, in ways that aren't exactly planned out. And when it comes to money, right? You don't have to be broke, but because they think, well, this is all around me and they only look at monetizing in a typical public figure. I'm a celebrity type of monetizing. They fuck around and still end up struggling when they don't have to. There's no way you, you should have that level of attention because we've had far less. We still got far less in terms of we don't have too many followers, right? Yeah. But knowing what your audience likes, what they see value, and then how do you sell it through proper sales funnels and things like that. That is the the real thing. People should just start messaging to, to these folks instead of just like, oh yeah, man, that's because your shit ain't real or you ain't popping like you think you are. Yeah, and I give him the benefit for that because I was, I was actually at this Revolt conference where, where he was talking about this and he, I don't Word. know if that showed, yeah, I was, I was, this is the same one from where uh, that Coach K clip came from. This was that Revolt conference. But, um, And I don't know if it's, it's in this clip, but I remember in that talk he went on to basically say exactly that. Like he realized, like, oh, like I wasn't really thinking about my audience as like consumers of a product because I didn't have a product. All I had was like these funny videos I was doing. And I think at the time he mentioned he was getting ready to like open some restaurants and, and do a couple of things to be able to start. And I know, I, yeah, it was, it was, I thought it was interesting. I was like, mm, restaurant man, I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, but <laughs> but I was like, but at least he was thinking ahead to that, right? Like, yeah. all right, I do need to start actively thinking about. What am I gonna sell to these niggas? Cause that is usually where it stops for most artists and influencers. What which, what was weird about it to me hearing him say, and this was a different time. I think this clip came from like 2020, you know what I'm saying? So this is before, you know, all these like influencer, all the different platforms started kind of like educating and training influencers on how to monetize, right? Yeah. And then we're in the era where the platforms don't want to pay you, so they'll gladly teach you how to make money off your audience. This is before that. I thought it was wild because I'm used to hearing that from an from artists, like the whole like, oh, I didn't think about monetizing my audience, so I don't know how. But I usually influences on top of that. You know what I'm saying? Like they usually they usually very very much so on top of that. But like I said, to his credit, he was one of the early ones that kind of was. You know, I look at like him and like the Shiggies and all those Yo. influencers back then, bro. They were they were the the, the sacrificial lambs for the influencers today to, to learn how to do better. You know what I'm saying? Man, <laughs> see, I don't even want to give people that flack no um, leeway no more, because like people really don't be the first these days. Like they'll like it's so much history of people monetizing in different ways. The problem is they might be the first in that way during that time, and all of a sudden nobody gets educated until the corporations decide to make education a part of their process, mm -hmm. right? Like the education becomes popular. So it's like if you're if your success is always dependent on the institutions deciding to educate you, you ass out anyway. Yeah, I agree. Because this was also around that same time. I don't know if you remember. There was that girl 
that was going viral because she was a big influence and she yeah, tried to sell it. Was the it's, young yeah. white chick. Yeah. She had two million followers, literally yeah. about exactly, and she couldn't sell twenty six shirts. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. So this was all around that time. Yep. This was all the same time period. And so I don't know, man. I think like I said, like I do think that that twenty eighteen to like twenty twenty, maybe early twenty 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 one well, no. I would say twenty eighteen, twenty twenty group of influencers, bro, they were they were the ones that had to Kind of fuck up so the ones that they could learn from it. Because now today, bro, it, you are, it is very hard to find an influencer that's not at least attempting to sell a product. Yep. You know what I'm, now, I'm not saying they're all successful or making a lot of money, but they all at least understand that, hey, once I hit a certain number, I got to at least start trying. And that number has gotten way smaller. Like, I feel like back then, they felt like they couldn't monetize until they, until they hit a couple million. I see influencers at, like, 8,000 followers, you know what I'm saying, attempting to sell shit, you know what I'm saying, like, you know what I'm saying, like, to your point, like, we don't have a massive audience, but we we sell products and events and things, so, yeah, I just look at it like that, bro, this was the group of people that had to fuck up, so the rest of us could be like, oh, no, I'm not about to be, I'm not about to be sending that 2 million followers and not making no money, bro. bro we were just talking with an artist <laughs> a few weeks ago, and I don't know if you remember, he was getting flown out to New York by oh, yeah, yeah. a startup, right? I would assume he got paid 5 to 10 bands. Yeah. Somewhere around that, or whatever, because he was dealing with outside the music industry. It was a private event, yeah, hopefully he so finessed. probably closer to 10, 20 bands. Yeah, I don't even think it was a situation where he would have finessed. I think it was gonna be. A, it was a situation where he got an offer and was like, "Oh shit, I yeah. didn't know this was possible." That's yeah. what it seemed to be the vibes, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, that's true. But yeah. like, <laughs> that's what it really looks like when you have a certain level of following and he doesn't ha- didn't have a million followers, and you get are reaching enough people. There are people in your fan base. That will pay you thousands. All right. If you have a hundred thousand followers, like real followers, and you're doing something and you're an artist, there's somebody you can get to pay you thousands. All right. We Adrian, like, one point we're gonna drop a conversation with him. He was doing college shows, mm-hmm. doing like at least three thousand per show, right? That's already thousands just off of that, mm-hmm. right? But the people who are doing weddings, private parties, like like some people are just doing like fan meetups and <laughs> almost I don't want to call it like a <laughs> I was gonna call it like the the boyfriend and girlfriend experience because there's I don't know if you know like like in Brazil that was where I first heard about this like them doing like the prostitution boyfriend experience thing or girlfriend experience like it's not like just a straight <laughs> transactional it's hey it's almost like an escort. But it sounded a little deeper, like, like I'm gonna like cook more for romantic? you, clean, yeah. Like if okay. it was really like a, a an experience, right? But <laughs> I digress. I'm not gonna get too deep into that. But like, <laughs> so I don't want to say that experience, but let's call it a friend experience. Okay, where you have a certain amount of your audience out, and like y'all do some normal cool thing. We're gonna go to Disney World together, right? Oh yeah, Tyler Swift be doing that shit. Like things yeah, like that, yeah. and people want to be a part of your group because you're creating an energy. You're damn near just a camp counselor at that point, right? <laughs> or, or you want a, a event promoter. But like, there's so many different ways to flip and get people to pay. And if you have an audience, again, now that's if they care about you in that way. Outside of that, there's still specific products that you can bring attention to. Like, let's say. Oh, people are using me to advertise deodorant a lot. My audience really seems to love deodorant because maybe I'm working out and or something like that, and a lot of dudes are following me, checking out my workouts or whatever. Maybe I need to drop my own deodorant brand. Crazy, you know what I'm saying? Like paying yeah. attention to the advertisers because that's all Amazon does, right? It's like, oh yeah, we let all these individual contributors sell on the platform. We got the data. We see that. Oh, they keep running it up, right? So now we need to drop our own Amazon Basics mm-hmm. version of it, yeah. right? That's the store version of it. That's what the stores did traditionally. Oh, snap, we need to have our own basic toothpaste, right? The yeah. Walmart toothpaste. You could do the same thing as an artist, as an influencer. Oh, man, this type of brand seems to keep paying me, right? That same brand keeps coming back, and they seem to pay other people in my demographic. Maybe I need to drop that. Maybe it's not my music or my show or something like that, but I there's something that the people who are watching me are interested in and I can get them to buy. Yeah, and I, I think too that goes back to just talking to your audience, paying attention to them as people, you know what I'm saying? Because that, all of those answers come from doing that, you know what I'm saying? To your yeah. point, Facts. Like, we, and we say this a lot, where 
as artists and creatives, you just get used to seeing numbers, right? So you look at a video and you just see a thousand views, but you don't know that one of those thousand views is a is a, a tech mogul that's willing to pay you ten and twenty k to come out. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Because you're not putting certain uh, things in place or where you can extract the information from them or even just get a chance to talk to them. Like I, I always think about, I have a homie um, as an artist and I remember one day he was on like a Twitch stream and he was about to get off and one of his fans came in and I was like, oh no, like I miss you. Like he was like, yeah, I'm about to leave. I mean, if you want me to stay, just like, no, donate a little bit of money. I might, I might hang around for another 10, 15 minutes. And that fan dropped like $500 on the spot. It's like that. Like, how, how long will you, will you hang out for this? He's like, oh shit! I mean, I could, I could probably stay another hour. You know what I'm saying? Thirty <laughs> minutes, hour. You know what I'm saying? Just, just, just because you did it. But it's, it's like, I don't know. I don't feel like that same interaction would have happened if that guy was just like a lock on the beat. Like it took him like talking to him directly to be, you know, to even learn that. Like, because I remember talking to him. He's like, man, I didn't even think my audience had that type of money to spend. I'm like, probably not all of them, but you know, yeah, you don't need, you don't, yeah, some exactly. Some of them got you know good jobs, bro. Like when artists be looking at their analytics and they start seeing that shit. Skew like 28, 32, and they be like, man, my audience is, is getting old. I'm like, I see money. <laughs> like, these niggas are stable. <laughs> they got nice, you know, at least decent to nice jobs, bro. Like, mm -hmm. I'm seeing, I'm seeing stability and, and, and opportunity here. Facts. You know, Facts. but yeah, I don't know. I think it just goes back to, bro, just like talk to your audience, man. Like, you know, get to know them. You got to. And let them know <laughs> that you are taking money. You oh, are yeah. open for shop. Yeah, facts. Right? Like, build that relationship with your audience. I think every artist, especially who are like moving indie, like for real, for real, every artist should have a way for people to reach out to them and make some sort of offer for private events. Yeah, facts. Right? Yeah. Just make it available. All right? Like, that's what I think La Russell's doing good is. I don't know if he has this particular, because I know he has an offer based system, but it's around things he's curating. But I feel like because he lets it be known that he's taking money or he's built off of his fan base and and there's always this transaction, I feel like if there's somebody who has a company or a wedding or whatever, some type of private event, and they're a fan of him, they would feel comfortable enough reaching out. Yep. And they would think that there's a chance that they would get an answer. That's all you need. Like yeah. just have a form. And be like, hey, if y'all want to reach out to me for private events, just let it be known that it's there. You don't have to push it all the time. Leave it in like your, your link in bio along with everything else there. And, you know, somebody's going to reach. You might only have one or two of those a year, depending on where you are, who you are. But one, you do it. And then two, when you do it, you know, try to make a part of that deal that yeah. you can let people know you did it. Yeah, but and, and but it's, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy you said that. And I do think this is mainly a rap specific issue, but we're as fans so used to the artists telling us how much they don't need us that you don't even think about doing so like that. Like, like I would never think to reach out to certain, like, like for example, I would never think to like reach out to Lil Baby for a private event. Cause in my head, I'd be like, man, this nigga makes so much money, man. He probably ain't gonna look at this. Like to your point, I probably can't even get to him. You know what I'm saying? There's no, yep. no form, no, no easy. I don't know who his booking agent is, but then someone like La Russell who is, you know, kind of constantly pushing that narrative of like, I wouldn't be here without the people. You know what I'm saying? Like that pushes people to want to spend money on you. You know what yep. I'm saying? Like, and so I do, like I said, I, I do think it's like mainly a, a, a rapper issue, but I think the bigger an artist starts to get, the more they start to kind of put their energy off. It's like, I don't really need y'all here. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's mm -hmm. nice that you are here, but I don't need you. I'm making all this money over here, over here, over here. And it's like, but they don't realize that to your point, like you're, you're shutting off certain opportunities for yourself. Because I look at really any type of entertainment brand is you like slinging hope to your audience. You know what I'm saying? And a couple of different types of hope, like hope that your life might be better. You know what I'm saying? Hope that things around you might get better. Yeah. But then also hope that we cool. You know what I'm saying? Like we friends, you know? And, and, yeah. and there's a there's a certain uh, level of benefits or, or, or things that I would get from this relationship. And so many people cut that that dream off for their, their fans and they wonder why they ain't making no money. It's like, bro, they, these, they feel like you don't need them. They feel like you good without their money. You're not... You know, to the point we had earlier, you're not presenting things to them for them to be able to financially support you, yep. and you killing off the dream that they could that they could get to you if they wanted to. It's like all these things lead to a dry well. You know what I'm saying, Bruh, So remember this when Beyonce got paid twenty four million dollars? Oh, that was like last year. Yeah. All right. So, oh, it was like they're giving more information, but she did twenty four million dollars for a single show, a private right. event in Dubai. Crazy. That's probably right? her whole tour. Facts. It's a lot of people's whole tour, yeah. right? So why is this something that you can learn from? Number one, 
You do these private events. Once you do a private event, you let people know you do private events. Mm -hmm. Show them that I did this, right? Don't even worry about what you got paid because maybe you didn't get paid something that you would have loved to get paid, right? Mm -hmm. But one, you're showing and advertising to people that you're open to this, mm -hmm. all right? So now when more offers come in, then, hey, now you can pick. Like, oh, snap, okay. And, and they know what the price is. They Well, no, see, that's level two. That's what yeah. I'm going to get to. Oh, yeah. like, right, that's what I'm saying. First, <laughs> that's what I said. If you don't, if the price isn't crazy, you just let people know you did it. It's like you show I did this and whatever, and now you you might just see what comes in after that. Yeah. Right? But then, yeah, once you start making that kind of money off of it, now you let people know what the price is. Yeah. Like you're, you're, you're creating value in the marketplace or showing people your value, and you're probably going to attract other people who got that type of money knowing, oh, snap, I could get Beyonce if I had $24 million. <laughs> I mean, that's a, now we're at a crazy range, right? Yeah. But like the Ubers of the world, remember her and Jay-Z got like, or maybe it was just her got like equity yep. and shit before, yep. right? People in that level know that, oh, I can get Beyonce for my private shit. And all I have to, I just have to obviously figure out a way to, to come up with whatever type of money. But a lot of people, not all the people, most people don't, but there are a good amount of people who got this kind of money. Yeah. So now you're talking about $5,000 for a show or oh, I got paid $50,000 for a show. You can let people know these things and don't worry about your price being stuck in one place. Like that's for people who are afraid of confrontation. It's like, yes, that last show was 50,000. What's the, the next person just says 50,000 and it's a year from now. Be able to communicate that the price is going up. Yeah, that's just uh, that just is what it is. Yeah. That's a natural part of the game. So sometimes people get afraid of advertising cost or what they did something for because they want to. They get afraid they're gonna get locked into it. It's like no, <laughs> yeah. you need to build the comfort or have your manager. Like that's just a, the price is always hopefully always going up. Yeah, man. You we all, we all at this point are familiar with the phrase "yesterday's price is not today's price." Yeah. you know what I'm saying everybody understands that going into yeah. any transaction with anything except for maybe like a Walmart. The only place that becomes an issue is if the prices start to go down, yeah. right? Because you just haven't maintained whatever you were supposed to maintain. Yeah, yeah. So, like, let people know. Every artist should have some open communication that this is possible, some way that this is possible. A simple form makes it easy to, like, look, now you, you know where they are. Let me just go check and see if somebody submitted the form today or whatever. You don't got to do a back and forth. You can let them know. You only expect to hear back from me if it sounds interesting or whatever. Or we can't manage all the requests, whatever you got to say to push them off. But like, just having that there, I'm telling you, anybody who does that, they're going to end up, you're going to end up with a lick that you had no idea was coming. Yeah, but it's like when I think about R&B singers, I never get why they don't. If I was an R&B singer, man, I would have a form to like sing at weddings and intimate shit, bro. That would, that would be that would be my product from exactly easy, bro. From day one, sing you know, at your uh, proposal, yeah. like all that. Yeah, type anniversary of stuff. dinners, bro. Come Such an easy ooh, bro. Such an easy at least. I don't know. I don't even want to put a price. People on. are spending a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> on weddings, easy, like frequently. Yeah, like that's crazy. I know multiple wedding people who do weddings and. Like one of like most of her weddings, one of the girls I'm thinking about, like are all like a hundred thousand dollar budgets. Oh, man, most good. of them. I right? thought you could get a wedding done for like twenty, thirty k, man. That's what I'm saying. So throwing <laughs> on a five to ten k for a special proposal from that type of person who'll do that, mm -hmm. like it's a doable thing. They yeah. are out there. I her did somebody's wedding. I can't yeah. remember who it was, yeah. but matter of fact, I think it was this girl's that I'm talking about. I think that's how I saw um, one of my sister-in-law's friends or whatever like i was looking at her page i was like is that her singing at the wedding and it just seemed like and it was just such normal people i was like are these people connected da, da, da. i don't know how it happened you know what i'm saying but like it's possible it yeah. is possible to like just like one if you want to have somebody at your wedding like might look go ahead shoot your shot you, you might have a bag to make it happen Cause you never know. Like these artists might be hurting worse than they really look like on the Facts. front end. <laughs> but two on the <laughs> other side, if you let it be known, you have enough attention. It is possible to land some of these higher ticket events for yourself. Yeah. All right, very very possible. Now, with that being said, let's change directions. Ghost writing in hip hop, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Whatever you feel, why do you feel that way? I'm gonna play a quick clip, interview clip of one of the most renowned, prolific, prolific, <laughs> infamous ghost writers 
due to unfortunate events. But, you know, maybe he says they are fortunate. Quit Miller. Check this it's out. really taboo, you know, to be a collaborator with a rapper. It's it's tough, man. It makes it tough to be like proud of your work and tell people about your work when it's like it causes this bullshit. So what you're saying is <laughs> hip hop has a different set of rules than every other genre. For yeah. example, Michael Jackson did not write Thriller. What people miss out on is the fact that hip hop has become pop. And at the end of the day, when you're talking pop, you're just talking about the best, biggest records that you could get. Who gives a fuck, you know, about how you get to it as long as you get to that it. That's a great point. Very, very good point. Somebody else added a differentiation between hip hop and rap in the comment section, which I would like to acknowledge. But the, the, the key is this. Hip hop started in a place or get or gained the culture early on of we're battling. Like it's me versus you. So obviously if it's me versus you, I need to be the one who wrote my lyrics, right? It's almost mm. cheating. Yeah. Right? If it's not really me and I'm saying I'm better than you based off of the, my lyrical ability. I would be like, I'm better than you because I had enough sense to go get somebody to help me. But hey, you know, man. Just, you know. See, that's that new age shit, man. <laughs> What's wrong with y'all kids? You know what I mean? But once you talk about what he said, the place in music being pop music, mm -hmm. now that aspect of it, it should be able to have both, right? Yeah. Uh, I feel like the freedoms truly are when both can exist, right? And you just know what that is and you know what this is and just leave it at that. So I, I get his point and it does suck. Like you say, it's harder to be proud of your work when it has such a stigma to it. You should be like, yo, I just did this shit for Drake, or I did this for this person, that person, but it's invalidating that person, so we can't even, you know what I mean? Yeah. We can't even advertise it in a way. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, but I do think the the sentiment around it has changed a lot since oh, that yeah, happened. For yeah, for sure. Like it's I, more pop. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I was watching this DJ Academics uh, stream where he talked about how it's crazy that Meek Mill basically ruined his career over a point that nobody cares about anymore. You yep. know what I'm saying? Like, we've evolved. And like I said, but he made a great point at the end of it where it's like, I, I do think it's the difference in the mentality between like rappers and just, I guess, non-rap artists where non-rap artists are usually like, hey, whatever I got to do to get the biggest song possible, that's what I'm going to do, right? Whereas like rappers are typically stuck on the point of like proving that like they can do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. it's like proving that they can do it, it's all them. But in any industry, in any sport, because music is a sport, like it's very rare that you see like one person carrying the whole team. You yep. know what I'm saying? Even 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 someone as great as like a LeBron, your teammates. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. to 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 help him shine and be as great as he can be. The the uh the guy the interviewer brought up Michael Jackson. Like I said, but Michael Jackson is one of the greatest artists ever that didn't write a lot of his biggest hits. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, shout out Quincy Jones, bro. But Quincy yeah. Jones was the, was the magic man with the pen for him back then. So that's what I, I always think about whenever I hear artists kind of bring up that point. Like, nah, like, yo, you got writers or producers or people. Nah, I, 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 produce, I produce all my own work. I engineer all my own stuff. I write all my own lyrics. I do all my own cover art. I do all my own video. And I'm like, oh, so you don't want to make it. <laughs> like, you don't want to be big, bro. Like, there's no way. <laughs> See, I don't say you don't want to make it. I just nah, say, who cares? Nah, you don't want to make it. Bro. Like, I just say, who cares and, like, and what's the impact? Like, like, it doesn't matter if the product isn't great. You can do all those things, but what is the end product? That's what I care about the most. Like, what did you produce? And you could be the producer, right? The person who ties all these things together. It still needs to represent your taste. You can decide, I like those lines. I like those lines. I like this beat. I like that, those be mm -hmm. beats, right? Like, you should still curate. But, yeah, like, all this, I did it all by myself. That's meaningful at a, again, like, skill for skill, artist for artist, craftsman level. And I think that's the, you know, you're a rapper or you a artist, yeah. right? yeah. That's the differentiation I feel like there is. Right? Yeah, I agree. And I, uh, you made a really good point. Like, I, I don't think artists, artists, oh, I want to say artists. Look, some artists and rappers, I think, definitely don't look at curation and executive producing as a creative skill. The same way they look at it, like writing their own stuff as a creative skill or, you know, producing or whatever is a creative skill. But I remember, man, one time I got to sit in the room with um, Saha the Prince, who, like, is like a, you know, writes a, a bunch of stuff for Kanye like, and to Quentin's point like he's very open about it because Kanye has built the brand where like we know it's 30 motherfuckers working on his shit so his people can freely walk around and talk about how they write for him so you get a lot of different perspectives on it but I remember he talked about how like 
when they write stuff for Kanye, it'll just be people in a room. It might be like 10 different laptops set up and then Kanye's just going to each laptop and then like looking at, you know what I'm saying? Like the 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 lyric, what they're working on, be like, okay, I like that. All right, let's change this a little bit. I'm like, bro, that's a skill. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. that is a, to be, it's almost like conducting an orchestra. You know what I'm saying? Like just because I can't play the tuba, doesn't mean I don't know how to tell the tuba the tuba player to give me what I want. You know what I'm saying? And it takes a lot of work to to, to be able to even guide somebody through that process. So, nah, you you, you got a bar then, bro. Like, you want to be a rapper? Or you want to be a you want to be an artiste? <laughs> <laughs> well, Sharante just sent in a clip of Chris Brown talking about ghostwriting. Let's let's play this right here. I never discredit writers who write on my album. I got hella co-writers and we do certain shit, right? Describe but, us. It's just like this. They can write it. Who gonna sing it like me? So at the end of the day, you might can write some beautiful shit that I, it gets <laughs> overlooked because it don't sound good. Mm. But okay, so one well, he looked he, he looked gone and he looked gone. He, he was enjoying yeah. himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that shit on his chest. <laughs> <laughs> but like <laughs> the. I look at it the same way in rap, though. Yeah, hundred percent. I was just about to say that. Yeah. Is a thing like Cardi B. I'm sure she has some ghost writers or something like that, but her voice is a unique voice. Mm-hmm. Her approach and the energy that she hits it with, it's the same as well. Mm-hmm. Like when we were, when it was just that super bar, exactly what you're saying mattered. That aspect of the culture, cool. But when we're talking about hitting from a song level on a pop scale, not just can you like what what lyrics can you rap. Performance is, is just important in rap these days. Yeah, and like and that's what that's what I keep going back to. Where I do think sometimes artists don't respect the the creative aspects of like all of the elements that make a good artist. Because you know I've, I've heard that same sentiment. Like he just said, people think like, oh, you wrote the words, so why aren't you lit? And it's like, well, there's so many different factors that go into it. Like I don't have the same brand that they have, so this song might not work for my audience. I don't have the same voice. I mean, I have the same resources behind me to make it go. Like, all these things that made sense for me to give this to Chris Brown or give this to, you know what I'm saying, whoever you giving it to. Oh, oh man, what? Hey, that, guy, that first comment threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not even going to read that. <laughs> Golly. Yeah, but. I, but. <laughs> so but, but I don't know. I just always look like that, bro. Like, artists got to gotta respect all aspects of the process. Because we keep just hearkening, I think that's the word, hearkening yep. on. You know what I'm or saying? Harping. Yeah, just the just the lyrics or are we just gonna keep acting like the lyrics are what make the song? It's a component of it, but I, it's, it's maybe maybe twenty percent max. You know Here's what a saying? comment right here. Someone said the reason why Kanye isn't considered one of the top MCs. I have my thoughts on that, but I want to see what other people are saying. Cap. I don't need writers. I might bounce ideas, but I only could come up with some shit like this. Now, that's probably him saying Kanye said that most of, Cap. People think he's one of the best. Good lord! And first off, that first that first that comment is. isn't fair. I don't need to rise my balance. I think that was like from his graduation era or maybe late registration. But are, are artists not allowed to grow and develop oh, and change yeah. their minds? You know what Kanye, I'm Kanye makes good music. He shouldn't be on anyone's MC list. Is that like a shot at rap at all, as a whole? Nah, Kanye stands find ways to make exceptions for him. Wrong. He's listed as one of the best artists. Huge difference. See, there we go. It ended. I see it. All roles came back to what <laughs> we said. Yes, he isn't noticed as one of the best MCs, but like that doesn't have to matter to you. If if being a a MC specifically is what matters to you, maybe you want that respect. And for all means, like build that credibility, build that skill set. What that looks like. Everybody has their community that they want to be accepted by. So cool. Do whatever that is. Personally. But in the grand scheme of this shit, like, nobody, none of it really matters. Yeah, nobody cares. Nobody, like, yeah, <laughs> generally speaking, like, the most, the the masses are not going to care about whatever your niche thing that you care about. Like, so when we're just talking about music, being an artist in general, it's going to come down to impact, right? Like, uh, what's best as a whole? Because there's a lot of great rappers who don't have great songs. Yeah, but what did Jay-Z send that one song, bro? If lyrically, what Oh, uh, Lyrically, I'd be... Common sense, but then I, or it's lyrically, I'd be like Ty, Ty uh, I'd be quality or common sense, yeah. but then I made like 10 mil. I have it around like common sense. It was yeah, something, yeah, like, something that. like that, bro. Right? Damn, crazy. Just like, man, no, I could do this and I like that. I do. But y'all don't really want that. Like y'all, y'all say, I really do. want that. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, again, there's always going to be 
the the purest in each category, whatever that mm-hmm. looks like. There's going to be some people who are like, oh, yeah, you can sing and these other people can't sing. Why is she more popular than you when she can't really sing as good as you and you can hit the notes so technically? All that exists. Mm-hmm. So what are we fighting for? Like, that, that was like, all right, are we talking about career? Are we just talking about massive impact? Are we talking about biggest songs? All right. Or if that matters to you the most, don't complain that the rest of the population doesn't care. You shouldn't expect everybody to care. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is what it is. Yeah. We all got something that we don't we care about and the rest of the world don't. All right, now this one, it's a switch up. Man, that shit crazy. Yeah, this one, <laughs> this one was interesting. Hey, that's gonna fuck a lot of y'all up, man. I ain't even gonna lie, cause it fucked me up when I saw it. So we hear about <laughs> these record deals, and I think it's nice every once in a while for the artists to get a sense of other deals in the entertainment industry and what some of these other people go through. So I'm gonna play this clip. That's talking about how Disney changes show titles so they don't have to pay nobody. That's what they're doing. Let's play the clip. They have this role where they don't have to pay you 100% of the WGA rates yeah. for three seasons. So that's why every three seasons they reboot it under different names. Uh-huh. It's like Hannah Montana Forever and Sweet Life on Deck. Yeah, yes. They have bit. a deal with, I don't know if it's if it's the unions or if it's the IMF, but they had a deal where the first three seasons of a show you bet, get paid 88% of scale. Okay. So it's 88% of like minimum wage pretty much for the crew and then the idea is you work on a show it becomes popular you go four five six seasons and you get 100 percent or whatever that is but then they by the third season even if the show's popular they reboot it as a brand new show so we were living maddie for the first three seasons and the last season was living maddie cali style oh Oh my god california and it's technically a new show yeah so they can go back to paying you like shit yeah exactly it's in our contracts that we can't renegotiate unless everybody decides to renegotiate very smart lawyers over there in the, in the mickey mouse <laughs> clubhouse that's shit crazy bro we'll leave it at that so a lot of times <laughs> when we have these questions about how shows are moving how come this show hasn't come back after this season or why do they switch it up so drastically it's always coming back to the money man it's always some business you know of course, sometimes you just don't think to think about it when it's not your space yeah but but yeah if y'all missed what he said so there's a rate. He, I think he said WGA is some sort of rate that they receive. And throughout the first three seasons, actors do not get paid 100% of that money. Mm-hmm. All right. But after season three, those numbers start to slide up and you get that 100%. So what do they do? After three seasons, they kill the show. But the greatest finesse of all of this is... They reboot the show basically as the same show, except with a different twist on it. Mm-hmm. So, like he just said, "Living Maddie" or something like that. I, I'm not familiar with that show. Yeah. "Living Maddie" is the regular show. Oh shit, I love this show. "Living Maddie," Maddie Cali style. Oh, why do they randomly move to California or something like that? I remember, like, you know, I think about some of those old shows. For some reason, the first one that comes to mind is like "Saved by the Bell." It's like "Saved by the Bell," they were in high school. And then all of a sudden, then they went to college mm-hmm. or sister, sister. They were in, uh, they were in like high school. Then they went to college. And then they, I think they, they might even did after college for a bit. Right. And it works with the storyline cleanly. But now I'm seeing that it probably, you know what I mean, has some other elements to play it as well. But one uh, one last thing, because I saw this in the comments, I want to be be um, clear to mention this. Even if it wasn't as prevalent for shows way back in the day. It seems like they said Zach and Cody, the sweet life, of Zach, sweet life of Zach and Cody is when they first like made this a thing thing, Disney. And after that, they just started saying, oh, snap, we need to scale this across all the shows. Yeah, that shit work. Yeah, <laughs> we need to get this across all shows. But, hey, I got to put this somewhat on y'all because they said if everybody comes together, they can re- renegotiate. See, and that to me is where the evil genius lies because- like I said, everybody has to ne- renegotiate, which includes whoever the star is of the show. Usually the star of the shows don't have an issue with what, what's ever going on. You know what I'm saying? They're probably, I don't know if they're getting 100% of the right, but they have so many other things going on. They're like, no, no, let's let this shit you know, rock the way it's rocking because cause I'm good. So now yep. as Disney, it's like, yeah, we put you in a fucked up situation, but you only still in this fucked up situation because Zach and Cody don't want to don't want to change nothing. Now, now they look like the bad guy. Well, not them specifically, but not. the mm-hmm. star of the show looks like the bad guy, right? Stuff started getting tight. Hey, bro, Disney different, bro. Niggas be thinking music 
<laughs> niggas be thinking uh, Lucian Grange and all these music industry execs. Oh yeah, different bro. No, nah, bro, these Disney bro, different bro. Disney, Disney's going through <laughs> it from so many angles right now. But at the end of the day, Disney is gonna figure out a way to be straight. Hey, bro, exactly, bro. Disney. Yeah. Hey, man, I feel like they probably. I feel like we gonna look back like a hundred years from now. Somebody gonna make like a documentary or a book on like all of the most fucked up entertainment practices and who pioneered them. I'm willing to bet Disney pioneered at least like eighty percent of them, bro. <laughs> I'm willing to I'm willing to bet I so be much surprised. money on that, bro. Crazy. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, hey y'all, that's it for today's <laughs> episode. No labels necessary. <laughs> I'm Brand Man Shaw. I'm Corey. We out. Peace. Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play in courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.